Hello and welcome again to Storage Day. My name is Jorge Lopez and I'm a principal specialist for storage and analytics. Hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Huey Hahn uh, and I'm a senior product manager from Amazon S3. And together we're gonna talk about uh, best practices for building a data lake on AWS. So as most of you know, data has become the most valuable asset uh, for organization. Uh, data drives innovation, more agility, uh, better products, uh, better services, and overall, a better uh, experience for customers. However, uh, many customers actually uh, struggle to manage all the data that they generate. And um, they spend the large majority of their time uh, doing tasks that are um, not productive. They add no value, like uh, building pipelines or preparing data uh, for analytics. Uh, so what, what, what's uh, the, the value of uh, data? Well, uh, a senior analyst at Forrester uh, found that for a typical 1,000 organization, um, just increasing data availability by 10% uh, could result in about a 60 million increase in uh, net income. So, Companies have realized that um, the legacy on-prem architectures of the past won't deliver on the desired outcomes, uh, getting all those insights and that value from uh, their data. And that's why many of them are uh, modernizing their architectures to a data lake on the cloud. So I know a data lake can mean different things for uh, different people. So at AWS, uh, we define a data lake as an architectural approach, uh, one that allows you to store massive amounts of data from structure all the way to unstructured data in a single uh, central repository. And then uh, you can make it readily available to be categorized, analyzed, and consumed by diverse groups uh, within an organization. Now, if you think about it, uh, experimentation drives innovation. The more experiments you can run, uh, the more you can innovate. And that's why data lakes are uh, very important for business innovation. A data lake on AWS provides a very broad set of analytic engines and tools uh, that allow you to run experiments on your data. Um, and if an experiment fails, you just move on to the next one, take the learnings, and that's it. So there are a, a few factors or characteristics of a data lake that makes this uh, possible. The first one is the separation of compute and storage. Uh, this is a fundamental shift from uh, legacy architectures. In this case, you can uh, scale each of these resources independently of each other uh, on demand. The second one is that in most cases, you can actually analyze the data in place. And that means you don't have to create and maintain additional uh, copies of the same data. Um, this is a, a major improvement in terms of uh, minimizing uh, maintenance overhead, but also reducing costs of those extra copies. And then you can actually use a very broad set of analytic engines to run experiments on that data at the same time using the same copy. Lastly, uh, you only pay for the resources that you use. So again, you want to run an experiment, uh, you spin up uh, your engines, run the experiment. Once you are done, get the results, shut it down. You only pay for what you use. So over the next 15 to 20 minutes, we're going to talk about some of the key considerations when you are building your data lake um, on AWS. The first one, actually using Amazon S3. Uh, as a fabric of your data lake. Um, we are gonna talk about uh, how to fill it with data, how to move uh, the data from the different sources into your data lake. Second one is around uh, security and data governance, a very important point in order to uh, make sure you um, turn your data from a liability into an asset. And the last one is about um, performance optimizations while keeping your costs down. So, Huey? Awesome. Thanks, Jorge. 
Um, so first, uh, let's talk about conceptualizing building our data lake, sort of what are some of the key components that, that go into it. The first thing to decide uh, when you want to build a data lake is where to actually store that data. Uh, and there's, there's, a first, uh, there's a few things uh, that you want to consider when deciding this storage layer, uh, specifically scalability, uh, securities, and ecosystem integrations. And S3 is a very good solution on all those fronts. And what, what I mean by that is first, scalability. Uh, to give you an idea of S3 scale, uh, today S3 holds more than 200 trillion objects and average over 100 million requests per second. So you can put any amount of data to S3 and not worry about any ever running out of uh, capacity. And the second is security. So S3 offer you various options for object encryptions. Um, so whether you want to do server-side or client-side encryptions and whether uh, you want to bring your own key for encryption or you want to use uh, one of these AWS services to manage the key, like, you know, KMS, key management service. Um, and, and for access control, sort of aside from encryptions, you can uh, leverage a variety of options such as bucket policy uh, along with IAM to provide very strong protections against unwanted access to your data. And the third thing is ecosystem integrations. So S3 integrate with a variety of AWS analytics and AI ML services, uh, such as Redshift, Athena, Glue, uh, EMR, um, as well as third-party software, uh, such as Snowflake or, or Databricks. Now, ecosystem integration is really important because you don't, when you put your data in your data lake, you, just want, you, you don't just wanna let it sit there. You actually wanna put it to work, uh, either through analytics or some type of AI ML models. And for that, you really want a storage layer that integrate with, with different services. So all that being said, um, today there are over 200,000 data lakes on AWS, um, on S3. And company, we have, we have companies like BMW, Vanguard, GE Healthcare, um, and more customers are adopting data lakes um, as a single source of truth on S3 to drive decision and new experiences. So now that you've decided where to store your data, this storage layer, um, the next thing for many customers is to decide how to migrate your data from on-premise to the cloud and how do you access that data. And for that, we also have a variety of options. So for online migrations, you can use DataSync. Um, DataSync can migrate or replicate files and object data very quickly, uh, either via a network or Direct Connect. Uh, Direct Connect is a alternative to using the internet to connect to AWS, and it's a little bit faster. And moreover, you can use DataSync to automate continuous transfer or active on-premises data sets into your data lake. Now, for offline, uh, we have the Snow family, which is a collection of uh, physical devices that help migrate large amount of data uh, offline without depending on network. So it's uh, very convenient as well. Now, outside of migrations for accessing that, that data lake, um, many customers prefer to have hybrid access. Um, so for that, we have a storage gateway, uh, which can mount directly on-prem for you to have um, a little bit of hybrid access to both on-prem data as well as uh, data sitting in S3 sitting in the cloud. So now that your data is on AWS, um, on S3, you want to put it to work. And AWS has a lot of different services to help you do that. Um, to give you a couple examples of what you can do um, for EMR, um, you can run highly scalable ETL pipeline for transformations and producing different view based on the data you, you, you have. Um, we also have Redshift, uh, which is a data warehouse for high performance SQL analytics. And we also have SageMaker if you wanna do AI and ML model. Uh, and, and, and SageMaker covers the entire machine learning lifecycle, uh, including from data explorations uh, to model training and to model deployment. So finally, um, now that you have your data lakes are, are set up, um, you know you have the storage layer set up. You are uh, you have the hybrid access. You have, you've done your migrations. You know what AWS services you can you can run to to put the data to work. You want to think about how you can actively ingest new data into your data lake, um, and for that we have a few options as well. 
uh, for streaming, uh, which is uh, a lot of time is for, you know, for example, log use cases. If you prefer an AWS managed solutions, we have Kinesis or MSK. Or if you want to prefer to run your own, you can run Kafka or Flink by yourself on our compute services such as EC2 or EKS. And besides streaming, uh, you might also want to continue to run ETL jobs to enrich your data sets. And for that, we have uh, AWS Glue. So now that you have set up your data lake, the next thing you want to think about is implementing security and governance. Keep your data protected and safe. So S3 offer a lot of features that help keep your data secure and protected. Um, just to give you a sense of what we offer in the most, if you want to go a little bit lower level and more primitive, we have IAM and bucket policy and access points. Um, we also offer a lot of encryption op op options. Uh, one thing we want to call out is we have this uh, feature called Object Lambda, which is compute layer in front of S3 that can modify and process data on the fly. For example, you might want to redact sensitive information before returning the objects to, uh, to your application. Now, one feature we want to particularly highlight is uh, access points. The use case for access point is that customers increasingly use S3 to share, uh, to, to store shared data sets. And uh, using one single bucket to store shared data set can put a strain on bucket policy. So access point helps simplify that. And you can create hundreds of access point in front of buckets, uh, which each access point specifically representing one data set. So it really helps you scale. And two weeks ago, we announced some exciting news for access point. Uh, we increase the limits of access point to 10,000 access points per region per account, uh, which really help you scale. In addition, access point now support uh, SageMaker, Redshift, and CloudFront. So outside of S3, we also want to talk about uh, AWS Lake Formation. Uh, lake Formation help you build and secure data lakes in days instead of months, and it gives you a central location to manage your data lake access. Um, it also offer you asset transaction through this feature called Govern Table. Um, and asset is becoming increasingly useful as data lakes becoming uh, increasingly shared, meaning more concurrent users can mutate the data, same data set at the same time. And last but not least, uh, lake formation offer fine grained access policy down to the row and column level. And increasingly, uh, we see a phenomenon, what we call data mesh, where data become increasingly more decentralized run by separate domain-driven smaller team rather than one single big data team. And th this uh, decentralization, uh, what it means is that it put extra need for you to put good governance uh, through those, lo uh, those features offered either by Lake Formations and the various S3 feature that, uh, that we discussed. And now I'm going to return back to Huey. Thank you, Huey. So we know performance and cost are also very important to our customers, and that's why we have an entire session dedicated to this aspect. Uh, but before we leave, um, I just want to mention um, a couple of capabilities that you can leverage. The first one is extra intelligent tiering, which automatically stores objects uh, in three access tiers um, and based on your usage patterns. So uh, first we have the frequent access tier, um, and then data that is not being used for uh, 30 days gets moved uh, into an infrequent access tier that has 40% lower cost than the frequent access tier. And then if the data is not used by an additional 60 days, a total of 90 days, it gets moved to the um, infrequent access tier uh, instant access. Um, so if a query spans data, say, on the um, uh, instant access um, archive, uh, then that data gets moved automatically to the frequent access tier, same performance, um, no retrieval fees. So that makes it uh, an ideal storage class for building data lakes uh, on AWS. The next one I would like to talk about is S3 Storage Lens. This is a capability that we introduced back in 2020 and provides organization-wide visibility uh, into S3 uh, activity trends and usage. Uh, it provides uh, insights um, in two very important dimensions. One is best practices for data protection, and the other one is uh, cost efficiencies. And you can do that uh, at the account, the region, uh, the bucket, even the prefix level. Uh, you can also export logs uh, into your uh, uh, very popular formats like CSV or uh, Parquet, and even publish those on Amazon CloudWatch. And the last one is FSx4 Luster. 
So Power by Luster, FS Export Luster, is a, a fully managed file system um, that when linked to your S3 data lake, it exposes those objects as files. So this is a very good option if you are planning to run uh, high performance computing workloads or uh, say machine learning uh, training jobs on your data lake. Uh, I will uh, strongly recommend FS Export Luster uh, to lower your costs and also improve the performance. And that takes us to the um, end of our session. I would like to leave you with some uh, few takeaways. First one, uh, consider S3 Intelligent Tiering um, as the default storage class for your data lake. Um, always use encryption and make sure to block public access to uh, all your buckets. And if you haven't taken a look to lake formation, uh, I also will strongly recommend uh, you do that. Uh, it can make it a lot easier uh, to build and deploy and operate your data lake. And it also provides critical capabilities uh, such as cell level security, uh, asset transactions, and the ability to share your data across accounts. So thank you so much for staying with us throughout this session.